Hello there. My name is Elliot Saba. I'm a senior research engineer at Julia Computing. And today I'm going to be talking about how we provide runtime switchable BLOS and LAPAC libraries via libblos trampoline on Julia 1.7 and higher. BLOS is the basic linear algebra subroutines. It's a collection of linear algebra routines bundled up into a shared library. We'd like to be able to switch between different vendors, such as OpenBLOS or MKL, at runtime without recompiling Julia or any of its dependent libraries. This is made difficult because of ABI variations between the different uh, vendors. As an example, symbol naming could be one of the ABI variations, where some libraries name the double general matrix multiply as dgem, and others put one or even two underscores at the end. Mixing and matching naming schemes, of course, causes linker errors, whether in the C code at compile time or in the Julia code at runtime if we're dynamically linking. Another example is index bit width, and this one's a little more subtle. When we're providing arrays of indices to some of these functions, 32-bit integers were originally used. However, eventually, humans wanted to use arrays larger than 4.5 billion along one side. This spread ILP64 BLOS libraries, where they use 64-bit indices instead. Mixing 64-bit index client code with non-64-bit index libraries can cause seg faults where two consecutive 32-bit integers end up getting in interpreted as a single 64-bit index. Another example is G-Fortran versus F2C style bindings, where some well-known vendors used the F2C utility to automatically translate their Fortran code to C code for the next release of their implementation, changing the calling convention for float and complex-valued functions in the process. Ignoring this causes certain BLOS and LAPAC functions to return gibberish. So as a short list, we have OpenBLOS, Apple Accelerate, MKL, all of these are vendors that we would like to link to in the Julia world because all of them have some uh, advantages at different times. However, as you can see, there's quite a variety of different kinds of ABIs just in this uh, small top of the head list. I've been alluding to a concept called trampolines from the very first slide of this presentation. And just to uh, quickly give an overview of what they are, trampolines are like uh, a very efficient function pointer. So for an example, when Julia calls dgem64, which is a symbol that's exported inside libblos trampoline, libblos trampoline itself will have a small assembly snippet for that function, which simply reads from a variable moves that into a reg register, and then jumps to the address contained in that register. In this case, the variable is dgem64 address, and that will have been set to a piece of code that lives inside of libmklrt, so that when we call dgem64, libblos trampoline will immediately jump to the, to the respective location inside libmkl that uh, will provide our 64-bit dgem. This flexibility is going to be one of the cornerstones of our solution, which is just a simple combination of three concepts. The first is smart auto detection, where we're able to interrogate libraries with small test problems to determine their index bit width, their F2C status, etc. The second is PLT trampolines, where we can forward client calls to the true BLOS library as efficiently and transparently as possible. Side note, these PLT trampolines are exactly what's used by the operating system and libc to provide dynamic libraries in the first place. So when you call a function that has been exported from another library, you don't know that address at compile time. And so at runtime, it sets a variable just like the one that we have here and performs a jump like that just like we have in our trampolines. Finally, we are going to maintain a table of pointers plus a little bit of metadata about those pointers to allow layering of multiple libraries. Libblos trampoline is going to dynamically detect all of the ABI compatibilities that we've listed so far, and it's going to export a consistent ABI. So if you're C code and you're linking against libblos trampoline to provide your BLOS, your BLOS uh, functions, you will be guaranteed that SC sum 64 is going to be 64 bit index and use G4Tran return values for its float and complex returns. Linking against libblos trampoline the C way would look a little something like this. You would build libblos trampoline, you would build software linking against it as if it were a BLOS, and then you would run it 
However, <clears throat> because libloss trampoline needs a backing BLOSS library, and your program may not realize that it's linking against libloss trampoline, it may think that it's linking against just any BLOSS library, we're going to use a side channel to provide the information that libloss trampoline needs to know in order to load that backing BLOSS library. So here we just export the default library that it should use, and then we can run our test and it works just fine. In a dynamic language, we have a lot more flexibility. Uh, in Julia 1.7 and higher, you can actually call blast.getconfig and you'll get an LBT config object that shows which libraries have been loaded. And so if we load the MKL package, which is going to uh, use the libblast trampoline APIs to load MKL instead of openblast at runtime, we'll see that the libraries change and openblast is no longer in the picture. Now I said before that we're going to maintain kind of a stack of libraries. To illustrate that, we're going to use MKL JLL and OpenBLAST32 JLL. These packages will only give us a library path. They're not going to integrate with libboss trampoline by default at all. So we're going to do it all manually. Here, we're going to manually call LBT forward on OpenBLAST32, and then we're going to call LBT forward on MKL. Now, an important note here is that MKL actually, actually defaults to a 32-bit um, index uh, interface. By default. So you will see that when we're loading these, libopenblast gets auto detected as interface LP64, which is 32 bit, and then MKL does the same. We would have to actually configure MKL before calling LBT forward in order to get 64 bit there, and that's what the MKL package does. But when we're loading just MKL JLL, everything's defaults, and so we only have 32 bits. Additionally, notice that libmkl is only forwarding, say, about a hundred less symbols than libopenblast. This is because some of the symbols don't actually exist inside of libmkl like they do in libopenblast. We'll see an example of this right here. Um, when we take a look at the config, we see that all three have been loaded and mkl and openblast are indeed listed as 32-bit instead of 64-bit. And when we ask libblast trampoline to tell us which library is providing this particular symbol for this particular interface, we see that sysum is provided by libopenblast whereas dgem is provided by libmkl. This is because even though libmkl is on top of libopenblast in the stack, mkl doesn't provide scsum at all, and so we fall through to the next library. This allows us to build very flexible BLAS library backend configurations, where a library author could, for instance, have an optimized dgem that they want to use, but they don't want to bother re-implementing every other BLAS function in the world. And so what they do is they build a shared library that contains only dgem. Then they can link that in on top of libopenblast. And libblast trampoline will be smart enough to point only the dgem calls to that optimized library and all the rest fall through to libopenblast. I think that's all the time we have today. So let's move on to questions. Thank you.